Welcome to our first live stream, Future Food System live stream. I'm really excited to have Jeremy here, um, who's a real architect, <laughs> unlike me. And yeah, want to acknowledge the traditional owners of this land for um, letting us build this house on their sacred land. And here we are, it's the greenhouse Mark V. And we're going to take you through all the different elements that have made this building what it is today. We're gonna to actually start with the water, water container. And this idea came about when uh, the bushfires went through in 2009 and, and quite a few people actually passed away because they thought they were safe. They thought they had pumps, they thought they had plenty of water. And because of the ambient heat that came before the fire, a lot of pumps exploded. And uh, that's when I thought, why don't we turn old grain containers into places that can actually protect. So this has got a seat in it and it's got a waterproof membrane inside it. And this idea will be completely open source. So Tim Gibney and Associates have engineered this building, uh, this um, structure, and it allows you to basically have 30,000 litres of water in case of a, a bushfire. And it's protected by water and by, by the um, container itself. So this will have a pump and the pump can uh, be changed over so you can actually use it for firefighting. So you can use it as a pool and, and as a water tank as a and, as a, so, and as for firefighting. So it's and not just 30,000 litres of water sitting there not doing anything. Well, the hope is that you never yeah. actually have to use it for mm. that reason, but you get to use it every day as a swimming pool. Really? Yeah. And it's, what's so great about this is it's EnviroSwim, which is an Australian, -made com Australian company that makes these completely natural pool systems that use copper to filter the water and electric current. No so, chemicals, so completely no chlorine. Chemical, no chlorine, no salt, no nothing. So I can't wait to do a bomb into this baby. <laughs> and then you can see here. So everyone will be able to see you from uh, Fed Square doing a bomb into it, it is a Matt little bit hard, so you pool. might not know that anyone's in there. <laughs> yeah. But there's a seat up here. And then we've got a tiny little roof up the top, which is, I've calculated, is enough for drinking water for a year. And we've got a stainless steel tank. So all the water off the solar panels of the roof will be used for drinking and cooking and that sort of thing and that's what this stainless steel tank is for. So how big is a whole house? Or how 80, big is it? 87 square metres is the footprint. Okay. But with the pool it's 100 square metres. Okay and the average size of the Australian house now is 250 square metres. So, so you're like wow. one quarter of the size of that yeah. and you're going to catch enough water for Matt and Joe to be able to drink? Well I mean we've only got you know, two thirds of the site is actually getting used for food production. Yeah. So that water's being separated. So it's only really a third of the site that we're using for drinking water. Okay. Yeah. Well, I've, got to, I've got to see how the toilet works in here. <laughs> well, that, yeah. <laughs> Come through. So you can see here as well, this is a inc really incredible um, design. A couple of guys that have I don't know what they were drinking or smoking when they came up with this, but they somehow ma managed to bend corrugated iron. So anyone that's worked with corrugated iron knows that it cracks and it's impossible to bend. But this is a really radical change because in, from a bushfire point of view, it means that you can't have embers entering on the corners. And yeah, it's a really, really incredible, uh, simple, and I think it's actually very Australian design you can't imagine so, so, so you're talking about how the corrugated iron comes along one wall and then they just fold it around the other wall rather than yeah. two pieces finishing and then having a, a flashing a daggy flashing in between it yeah. it's actually from an architect's point of view it's actually really beautiful well it's it's like what a great way to finish it and, yeah. and vermin proof as well yeah and super efficient yeah yeah okay and completely recyclable at the end of the building's life you can see here as well this is the first building that I've done, or the second actually, I did the Lexus Pavilion the same way, where I haven't used light gauge steel. And it's, it's really, um, I wanted to build a building that was incredibly resilient, strong, um, but was able to hold soil. So this building can carry about 40 tonnes of soil. And it's kind of reverse engineered. So what I've done is use the soil as a foundation. And so there's no issues here with having soil on top because of the way that it's been designed structurally. And so we've used heavy gauge steel in most situations and that's what everything's tied to internally and externally. And so it seems like your whole frame is all steel, no concrete. No. Um, so I guess the goal is at the end of all this, Yoast, that you can recycle the entire building, the whole frame, yep. everything. Yep. yep. Zero waste. Well, as you know, I'm obsessed <laughs> with zero waste. So if you can't recycle it, I don't want it. Yeah. <laughs> Which actually counts out about 90% of materials. Because most buildings are built with concrete, 
a bit of steel, some timber, yep. you know, and then some adhesives holding it all together. Yep. What did they say? Between three and 400 different chemicals are airborne when a house is finished. So glues, resins, coatings, paints, um, you know, so this building, what most people say when they walk in and they go, it, sm it doesn't smell like a, a house at all. And that's because we haven't used any glues, any synthetic materials. It's just all natural this materials. It smells like a uh, lawn here, or it smells like Apollo Bay. That's what yeah. it smells like. The uh, Cypress Macrocarpa. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, that's, I'm really proud of the fact that there's not one stick of FSC timber in this <laughs> building. So everything's come from a farm. That seemed like a great idea, but it was a bit challenging. Oh, we need, Lockie, we need some more timber. So he sets up the mill, cuts the timber. Oh my God. So but, Yosh, can you tell me about your grand staircase here? Like, you know, what is this? Well, this is just <laughs> while we're building, of course, but I love using anything that's going away. So this pallet is really, no one wants them because they're 1.4 meters by a meter. So yeah, they're a waste and they, they come from Japan. They have car parts on them. And so, so have you used them for anything else? Uh, they, they're great, like for yeah. trellising and, and fe temporary fencing and yeah, I love how the light so goes ev through. Even when you build the building, you don't get new formwork in, you actually just use other things to help you build yep. to make sure that even even the way that when you're building something, it's got a, another use. It's not yeah, even Yeah, like all this plywood has come off form ply that's been used several times, you know, so yeah. I, I mean, look, it is, there's no doubt about it, it is more work, but this form ply would have been used half a dozen times yep. to form concrete. Yep. And then they just, right, right, that's it. And then we go through it and, and cut it and use it for everything. Yeah. Yeah. Come in, mate. <laughs> Thank you. I I'm excited to show you. I can't, I can't wait. Come on, get me inside. <laughs> so this is, we don't have a front door yet. It's um, arriving on Friday. But... Um, this is really technically still outside, so you're actually outside. That's how we were able to have the battery wall. So it's like a garage. So this is your battery wall? So this is the battery wall. I wondered what that was. I thought it was an art installation. Well, this is, you know, how obsessed I am with, um, <laughs> with zero waste. Batteries are a disaster when it comes to recycling. Like, you can't recycle. They're difficult to recycle, especially the battery walls that are going into houses. And so I've just been researching, researching, and then this, uh, I came across uh, nickel iron batteries about 10 years ago. I wanted to use them in King Lake and everyone convinced me that they were no good and, and then I came across this guy that was constantly answering questions on blog posts and I thought he must be in California. So this guy really knows his stuff. And then he put his surname in one of the conversations. So I googled it and he lives in Hillsville. <laughs> and so I met him and the following day I was at his house. And so and well, He's off grid in Hillsville. Tell us the benefit of nickel iron. So the beauty about this battery is that at the end of its life, it can be completely recycled, 100%. And there's no toxins. So it's literally just nickel and iron? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> and do you want to see something really crazy? You know how we, we need to sequester carbon? Yeah. That's what these batteries do. So these batteries have been cycled in for maybe six weeks. Yeah. That's carbon from the atmosphere. So these absorb carbon from the atmosphere <laughs> But not only that, this battery here is 100 years old and still works. As good That's... as the day that it was made. So this is a battery that can be recycled, but it probably never will be. Like my grandchildren will have these batteries in their houses. Incredible. So it's a battery that lasts a lifetime. And you ha they're, they're not more commonly known as Edison batteries because yep. Edison made electric car. He was obsessed with this technology. And, um, but the factory was shut down in the 70s, mainly because... Well, you only sell them once, and then you know. But yeah, we, we, went, to a guy, a we went to a guy last week, and he he had um, he's off grid, and he's got batteries from World War II, and he gave us this one. So he said, <laughs> "You can have one." So that's our battery wall, and you know, my dream is to set up a factory here in Australia yeah. to make these because between two and three million houses they estimate are going to go with battery walls in the next ten years. And so, tell us about how you charge these. Like, have you got solar? Yeah, just panels solar. On the side? So South Australian made solar panels. So Australian made solar. Yeah. And um, have, you got a, have, have you got a good electrician installing those for Brick, you? Mate, the boys from Brick. <laughs> I'm doing their heading. What are you doing now? You're adding this? It's like, I need a, I need, so here's a mushroom wall. Oh, can, so, can I just ask about the, the electricals? Because yeah. it looks like your cables coming down here are blue, not white. So what's sp yeah. special about the cables that you've got running in this place? Well, as you know about, I've been working with plastic and trying to recycle plastic. Mm. And one thing I've learned is how toxic and terrible PVC is. 
So I'm trying to go completely PVC free in this house. So that cable doesn't contain PVC. These, all the plumbing is PVC free. Okay. And, and where it, you can, you're running the water supply in copper. Yeah. At the end of its life, it can be reused. Yeah. So yeah. if it can't be recycled or bio, if it's not recyclable or biodegradable, I don't use it. Okay. So it's that easy. Simple. easy. It, Sounds well, so easy, Yost. Well, it, it, it basically <laughs> cuts out 95% of the materials. That, if you go into Bunnings, it's like, okay, you may as well walk straight out because there's nothing there, you know. All right, so sorry, you were going to tell me about the mushrooms. Yeah, so, you know, the boys think that they've worked out how much energy, how much, where to run power, and then, fuck, I forgot about the, you know, this. So what we're doing is the shower is on the back of this wall. So this is going to be a mushroom, basically a room filled with mushrooms. And we're using, like we all generate so much waste that can feed mycelium, whether it's coffee grounds, cardboard boxes, egg cartons, anything woody yep. is a great feed stock for mushrooms. So we Can you, you use the word mycelium? Can you explain to us what that is? What's that mean? Well, mycelium is basically the, the roots of the mushroom. So the mushroom is really just the, the flower that comes out at the end. And so the mushroom is like the fruit on, yeah. on the mycelium network. Yeah. So uh -huh. You can see how many mushrooms are actually growing there. And that process takes about two to three weeks. And, and so, Yost, why attach this to the back of the bathroom? Are you using moisture or something from the bathroom? Like yeah, so we're, we're funneling the, the steam from the shower straight into this room. Ah, oh, okay. So you're and creating then the perfect this produces, environment. This produces carbon monoxide. And that is great for the plants that are in here. So we're trying to cycle it so we basically have a little fan that pumps it straight into the greenhouse so we've got a vertical greenhouse here and that's um got the biodigester so is that is that what this is yeah so this beauty is this is like our cow have you ever made compost of cow manure <laughs> uh i've made compost not with cow, cow manure yost but tell me how well once you use cow manure you're just it's it's like the best <laughs> compost you've ever made in your life you go wow and that's because cows they, they go through, the cow's stomach makes, a, makes it go through a fermentation process. This uses exactly the same microflora. So we inoculate this tank with the microflora of the cow. So using cow manure as like a starter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then once that bacteria starts to grow, we feed it. So above this sits the toilet that goes directly into this, but also we've got an insincorator. So all the organic waste gets mulched and goes into this biodigester. So you're literally feeding this shit? Yeah. <laughs> and and um, organic waste from the kitchen. So John yeah. and Matt will be cooking in the kitchen, sending that in insincorator into here. Okay, cool. And, and is that safe? It's safe. There's about 12 million people in the world that rely on methane okay. for hot water, cooking, that sort of thing. So I'm just trying to bring this technology from the third world into the first world. <laughs> And it's, but every single one of us produces about a kilo of, of waste. Okay. You know, it's scraps from the kitchen and that can go into this. That's an hour of gas. Oh, okay. So, 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 where, so does, where does this come from? I've never seen this before. Where this is from uh, a bloody awesome company in Israel called uh, Home Biogas. Okay. And I visited the guys last year in, in uh, Israel, yeah. just outside of Tel Aviv. And they're just a bunch of awesome young guys that came up with this idea and they wanted to do the, you know, bring an idea that they saw in India being used into the Western world. So they're now working in developing a system that goes into walls for apartments in places like Brooklyn. Oh, okay. So they want to make it a mainstream place so that when you turn the gas on for cooking or when you need heating, you don't even know if you're using methane or natural gas. So, so if you, you imagine like 7.8 7 billion people, 7.8 billion hours of gas per day. So we're sitting on this incredible energy source that we're not using. So if Matt and Joe are living here, they're going to the toilet, they're cooking upstairs, how much gas do you think they're going to generate here? Well, the guys in Israel calculated because of all the gardens here, yeah. it won't just be one hour. They yeah. think it could be potentially between four and five hours of gas a day. Are they going to need that much gas? Because, you know, when you buy a rhubarb, <laughs> yep. you, you, you're buying the stems, but the, yeah. the, the leaves are, of course... Oh, okay. so for, They say for every kilo of food, there's two kilos of other okay. roots and... So that's all going to go in here. And um, so, so what happens here is, right, this ferments, the, does, does the fermentation process, but then yeah. it goes into a worm farm outside yeah. and adds a whole bunch of other microflora. So okay. what I'm basically doing is creating the most unbelievable fertilizer that's loaded with microbes, bacteria, good stuff, to then feed the plants. So I'm creating Which like then a, Matt and Joe will then eat again? Yeah. So it's an endless cycle? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So that's like, it's such an exciting concept to think about how, much, how yeah. much we can actually use, whether it's the woody stuff for the, for the mushrooms or it's this, 
and then you've got all the solar energy. Like we're sitting on such a resource that we're not not using. I'm just thinking about this for you know like uh, one of our Nightingale projects. Imagine if we could do this and capture you know 50 households. Oh, you know. and they have yeah. systems for that they actually make dairy farms that could be for up to 100 people. So they they are working on much bigger systems. So it's it's you know it's an amazing concept. Okay. And then this timber is in uh, late July. We cut down a macrocarpa tree, so which is also known as a cypress tree. Yep. And and so, f- I think that there's the most famous ones are down the Great Ocean Road. Yeah. As big trees, but they're also used for when were that when you were telling me they were planted like at the. So what we did, you know, because mm. we thought we were really smart, we cut all the trees down, <laughs> and then they realised all the lands were dying from wind and you know the harsh conditions and no shade. Shit, we've cut all the trees down. So in the 1870s, I started planting trees and the easiest one to grow was the macrocarpa because okay. you could just strike it from cuttings. And so they planted not thousands, but millions of macrocarpa starting in 1870. So all of those windbreak trees you see next to farming land, that's all yeah. cypress macrocarpa. Yeah. And what's the, it, it, it smells incredible. Like, uh, yeah, it's that oil that actually makes it naturally termite resistant too. I, I mean, I love the smell of it and it's, um, you can use it for decking and you can use yeah, it. Yeah, because it also makes it really resilient, doesn't it? So you can put it outside. It's yep. like a class two timber. Yeah, it's incredible. Yeah. And it's getting mostly wasted at the moment. Like farmers burn it because when the trees fall over and the cows eat it, it actually causes abortions. Oh. It causes them problems yeah. because they gorge themselves on it. So farmers, oh. as soon as they see that a tree is about to go or on its way, they'll actually cut it down. And, and whereas we should be using that for timber. Yeah, okay. And so this, as you know, like I'm a huge fan of agroforestry and getting farmers so i can't stand monoculture yeah and all, all of fsc timber pretty much comes from a monoculture so yeah. you're standing in a forest with where all the trees are born on exactly the same day yeah they usually got the same parents so they're all planted exactly the same distance apart and you're standing in you, there's no wildlife yeah. there's no biodiversity there's nothing so you see you basically We can't support that. And what's happening now globally is that governments are actually getting subsidies and carbon credits for cutting down wild old growth forests because they're replanting it with plantation forests, which is the most insane idea in the world. So we're we're losing losing, our biodiversity. So we've got like 130,000 farmers that even if they planted 10 trees a year and we, our carbon credits went to them to actually grow them properly Mm -hmm. and create really high quality timber, that transition can happen in as quickly as 20 years, but it needs, people like us to say let's use farm source timber. <laughs> so we're going to talk about this later because currently in our specification schedule we start with Australian FSC timber yeah and then that kind of that's the that's the top of it well actually after recycled but still I, I feel like and we've got to have a conversation about this and how do yeah, we and do that at scale. really good like yeah. Yang and Gert Farm in mm. Dean's Marsh is a really good example they plant they started planting yeah, yeah. trees in 28 years ago you introduced and, me to them <laughs> yeah yeah and they're now harvesting these incredible <laughs> logs you know yeah. and it's like there's it, it's not like it's new but yeah. if, if we use like 30% of our land, like the land that is suffering erosion and all these problems, if we use that, you know, we could supply not only Australia, but we could export timber all over the world, really high quality timber and have ongoing jobs for hundreds of years. Oh no, didn't you know we only export coal and gas out of Australia? Mate, don't <laughs> talk to me about it. Do you want, uh, what, about, what do you think of the tiles? The tiles are beautiful. What are they? So this is um, um, Trent, who's the builder, helping yeah. me with this, Trent Alexander. He said, I said, I need a, a concrete tile because I want the floor to earth and I want concrete because you can just crush it and recycle it. I don't want a, yeah. a, a, a tile that's a ceramic tile that's yeah. gone through a, a baking process. And so he kept saying, there's a company that makes amazing tiles and he couldn't come up with the name. So about four weeks later, he said, Sadler, oh, Sadler yeah, Tiles. Yeah. So I Googled it and this old 80s website came up and it's like, and there was a phone number on there. So I left a message and this guy called me back and he goes, oh, we're no longer called Sadler, but um, we're in Kyneton, and, but the business is actually based in the US now. But I do all the and R&D so, here in Kyneton. So what's the, what is the what is this? Why does it feel like leather and not like concrete? Well, Peter Sadler yeah. was a fine arts student in, at RMIT. Yeah. And he, in the 70s, they asked, the, the, the project was that you had to create fine art using industrial processes. So he poured concrete onto polished glass ah. and got this finish. And it's, it's incredibly soft and warm, yeah. isn't it? And you don't need to coat it. It doesn't need any finishing. It's just once it's, this is it. And the, there's floors, there's about 2 million square meters of this floor all over the world. Wow. Like you got boss stores have it yeah. and, and um, uh, Southgate's got it. 
you know, so it's, it's a really practical floor. As Tough, hard as granite. Hard wearing. Yeah. And then at the end of the life of the house, you just crush it and use it again. But even better, we've forged this really amazing relationship and he's now um, looking at taking, like there's a lot of recycled content, uh, content that's gone into this tile, especially for us. But he's also um, looking at completely removing sand because I've showed him the, the glass yeah. dust from yeah. the glass crushers from the restaurants trying to find alternatives, you know, for this. Well, because it can be a problem quarrying sand, right? Yeah. yeah. Like a lot of sand quarries here happen on, you know, um, uh, First Nations people's, you know, land and it's, you know, it can become incredibly problematic from the, for the landscape. Yeah. Whereas you're saying use uh, recycled crushed glass using that as silica instead yep. of using sand and it has a whole new yeah, life Yeah, and he, he's actually uh, found that, it's, that the tiles have actually worked really well. So for him, it's like he's, I've forced him to think outside the square, even though he spent his whole life making this stuff. And he's been really excited and, by it too. And can I ask, why, why use a concrete tile inside a building that's so lightweight? Like everything, it's all just steel and, you know, this timber and, you know, you can be lifted up and moved around and you're using something that's dense like this and it looks like you're going to get some sunlight on here. Like what's the benefit of that? Well, the only heating in this house is floor heating. Yep. So we're using a heat pump to, yep. to heat the, the floor. So concrete is brilliant in that instance. So what we've got is we've got magnesium oxide board, which is this material. Yep. I'm obsessed with this material. We should be making this in Australia. This is a material that was, I was first told about by the CSIRO in 2005, and I yep. wanted to use it on my house. This is like this tile, just cured at room te at amb ambient temperature. And, and so what is it, literally just it's, it's, magnesium? It's raw magnesium yep. bonded with water, like it creates a really strong bond. Yep. And it's totally fire resistant. <laughs> oh, really? But best of all, you just crush it and turn it back into another sheet. It's completely recyclable. Yep. So it's got no silica. And uh, Matt, who has been working here, normally suffers from cramps. And he said since he's worked here, he's had no cramps because of the, the magnesium. Okay, in incredible. And so you, you've got, so we've got magnesium oxide. Yeah, got magnesium got oxide, got two layers of Dura panel, which is another brilliant product. And then this is the, we've got heating and then this, and then th these tiles. And so by using the magnesium oxide, which is a dense product, by using the concrete, which is a dense product, yep. it works as thermal mass, like a, like a cellar yep. or, or like a, a stone in a half. And yep. so it, it gets heated up and it stays at that temperature for longer. Yeah, and in summer we run cold water through the... Oh, incredible. So, so then it keeps the place cool. Yeah. And the way that our body um, interprets heat is two thirds through radiant heat. So what's, what's the surface temperature of this? That's how we experience. Yeah. And only one third through air temperature. But strangely enough, in Australia, we obsessed with air conditioning, yep. heating up the air, superheating it, and it all sits up there. I know. <laughs> and we're uh, still cold. It drives me crazy, you know. And my mum lives in a house that's, you know, it was built in the 80s. Mm. And, and um, so this is going to actually, I should say that, this is actually going to be my mum's house <laughs> in Mombok, ultimately. So that's how we've been able to finance this project is um, I've got some really good partners like Mila and... Uh, Bendigo Bank that have come on board as sponsors that allow us to have it at Fed Square and Fed Square's yeah. kindly given us this site free to be able to do this as well. But my mum has basically paid for this house which is going to be her home. So we've been able to do that, you know, kill two birds with one stone. <laughs> so it gets reused again? Yeah. It's not just like turning up as well, an it's, exhibition? It's made it actually a much more special project for me because building a house for your mum is like, it's pretty cool. You yeah. Because you know, like my mum is one of those people that goes into a garden and then decides what to cook for dinner. <laughs> yeah. So this house is a garden, you know. But um, where does she live at the moment? She lives in Mombok on a farm, but she's got sold her farm to my brother and yeah. now she wants something smaller. Oh, okay. Um, so tell us about, tell us so about this. Again, another, another thing I found out from Justin Leonard from the CSIRO, he, he, I'm obsessed with straw because straw is such a big so waste is this, product. So is this the inside of that? Yeah. So this is, oh, this is by the way, the Rehau floor heating. Okay. But this is um, compressed straw. In so they set up in 1952 in Ballarat, in Bendigo, sorry, and started using straw. And, and so what's this on the outside of it? Just a paper finish. So paper on the outside of compressed straw? Yeah, with no glues, no nothing. It's just pure compression and heat. And the embodied resin within the straw locks, up, locks the material together. And then they use just a flour-based, a wheat-based glue to glue the paper on. And it's that's like paper it. mache. Yeah. And, then, and, and it kind of looks and feels like plasterboard. Yeah, you know, it is more absorbent it, than plasterboard, so you do need to... But, of course, I want these walls to breathe because I've added 
so the kitchen which you'll see upstairs is made with the macro carpentry that we cut down yep. and we saved the sawdust and turned that into charcoal and because i want these so walls when, to when breathe you, saw, you got these this timber saw you got some um some sawdust and then you got that turned into charcoal yep and then you got the charcoal put in here yeah so these guys Why? <laughs> well because i really it actually was just a really random thing but we're in cuba jenny and i were in that for on our honeymoon in cuba and I read in the paper there was these Danish scientists in Cuba trying to work out why Cuban hospitals didn't have golden staff, didn't suffer golden staff the way that the rest of the world did. And they put it down to one U thing that Universal they Universal healthcare? <laughs> no, nah, well, they had a little bowl of charcoal yep. in every hospital room. Ah. Oh. And what they'd worked out was that the charcoal acted like a sponge. Yeah. And oh. that got me thinking, oh my God, why don't we just use charcoal in our building materials? And so in Sydney Greenhouse, I actually used it in the magnesium oxide. But here, yeah, we used 100 grams in every square meter. So I think we used about 120 kilos, maybe. So these panels are absorbing toxins, yep. if there are any, into the wall. Yep. Forever. So Forever. One, <laughs> one gram of charcoal has a surface area of a tennis court. Okay. And so do you think that Jura panel, have they just done that for this project? Yeah. Or will they do that beyond this well, project? Well, they're pretty excited by it because this is like the random thing. They do testing on everything that they make, right? Yeah. And so they do a pressure test. So they have this as a walkable, trafficable uh, roof where it's supported at both edges. And it can normally withstand 480 kilo pressure point, point load. And so they do a, a point load test. Yeah. With the 100 grams of biochar in it, it went up to a ton. <laughs> So you can drive a car on your roof, on your ceiling. Like, what the hell? So they kept testing and they go, we don't know why. I've got some very smart friends and I've asked everyone, why would it be able to be, why would it be so much stronger? Like a, a hundred grams of biochar is nothing, you know? But why does it make... Yeah. Anyway, that's... Can you, can you, is there something else in here? Can you show us what's in here? Yeah, so this is the bathroom and you can kind of see the layers. We've, we've kept this off. You can see the, the floor heating sits underneath there. The thing about straw bale buildings is there's always a lot of straw, you know, so as soon as there's a <laughs> penetration, I mean, I love it. I'm always cleaning up, but the, and here you can see, this is not your ordinary stud wall. It's, this was actually a, a pine tree off a golf course, not off a farm. So I lied about that. Yeah. <laughs> and then here, this is really cool. So another reason why I'm obsessed with having a concrete floor is because I want, when you're walking here barefoot, you're earthed. Yeah, okay. So what we've, you can see that there's a rod there connected into the ground. My yeah. nephew, Yule, is an electrician and set this up for me. And so what you do is you can actually stand on here. So when we lay these tiles, we're actually going to lay them onto copper, which is connected to the, to the earth outside. And so I don't know if anyone's seen that earthing movie. Some, or Josh Tickell and Rebecca Tickell from California made this great film. Um, Brian is a good family friend of ours, Josh's dad, he lives in Lawn. Anyway, he made this film about this, so you should watch that. But when you're earth, you can't have inflammation. So if you're walking on the beach barefoot or you're walking uh, in the grass, especially moist grass in the morning barefoot, you're, you're earth, you're connected to the, to the mag magnetic field of the earth. And, I'm, and I'm it's take impossible it to have inflammation. So what I'm trying to do is where, whenever you're walking in this house, you're connected to the outside world. And that's another reason why concrete is a great conductor. So if I put a timber floor in here, you, you wouldn't be earthed, you can't be earthed. So you'd need to use steel, copper or concrete. I, so, I haven't taken my shoes off in about two years, you guys, so it's, I'll have to get my shoes <laughs> off on, and walk on the grass. Off, <laughs> but I'll, yeah, so what you can do is actually test for it, right? And so this is connected to the earth down here. And you'll see the difference. So if I'm, standing, if I'm standing on this mat here, can you see that? Yeah. yeah. We actually have to get the earth. The, here it is. And this is just um, something that has made it so much easier with these tiles. And then what, what you do, you can actually undo that one. Love Yost that you're so hands on that you don't actually need a technical assistant here. So see, I'm down to almost zero. So that the goal is to be zero zero. So if I stand outside in the grass, which I can't because there's a fence there, I'll be zero zero. So 
to, to actually to actually know that when I'm walking around the house, it's the same as walking on the beach or walking. So that's another reason why I want floor heating. So my, yeah. my mum can just walk around all year long, you know, cold floor in summer and warm floor in winter. Yep. And then this massively insulated um, walls. So we've got double layers of Dura panel yep. with a cavity, 35 mil cavity in between for power and all that sort of so, stuff. So double layer of Dura panel, it looks like it's only about 60 mil thick. Yep. Um, when you put that together, like what's the R rating? Do you know what, you, what you're getting? We'll have a clue. <laughs> but you know that it's... It's off its head though. <laughs> it's I mean, off its head. E everyone that... Um, because it's continuous, right? There's, yeah. no, there's no studs in between it where the insulation's missing. Yep. Yeah. Um, this, and just quickly, like this is another crazy... Um, this is the, the, all the windows that are being used. So this profile comes from Switzerland. And thermally it's like, broke, it's like thermally a little broke windows are a bloody yep. nightmare to, to recycle, but and because they're normally a whole bunch of different materials bonded together. Yep. This is all steel. Ah, okay. So when the sun hits the outside, this gets hot, this stays cool. And, and you can just recycle it. At the end of the building's life, you can just recycle them. I'm really interested in this because um, it's hard for us to, to make a, you know, where a building loses all its heat or, uh, or gets hot in summer is generally through the windows. Yeah. And so we specify thermally broken windows, but yep. they've always got this neoprene gasket, which means that we can't recycle it at the end of its no, life. It and end. also they're always made of aluminium, um, which uses six times as much energy to produce as steel. Is your steel windows. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, yeah, I love steel. Especially <laughs> <because> <laughs> I'm starting to get that. <laughs> <laughs> well, magnets pick it up so easily as well. We've, we've don't have a lot of time, so let's go upstairs. Yep. So, uh, this um, will always be open. So there's actually a front door, so that will be an insulated door. Yep, okay. Even though this, because th there's all louvers going in here. Okay. So this will be like an outdoor atrium covered with plants, so yep. you'll be walking into like a garden. Come upstairs, mate. I'd love to. It smells like a, a sawmill, doesn't it? It does, or a little bit like a sauna. It smells like cedar. I mean, obviously it smells like macrocarpa, but it also... This, this uh, we're getting the guy who actually did the zinc at Federation Square is doing our bench tops out of zinc. Oh, really? I love zinc. Yeah. It's just, um, I went to a place in Paris and I asked them how old the kitchen was. It was 350 years old. It was zinc. And it just looked amazing, you know. Well, because zinc doesn't rust? No, and it's warm to yeah. touch. So when you lean on it, you know, it's steel and yeah. stainless steel is really cold. Yeah. Yeah, this is it, like it, it's... Warm. And it's kind of softer so you can get nice rolled edges on it. Yeah. So this, this was a, a pine rafter out of a warehouse, which um, Andrew Aramore, a friend of mine, who made this whole kitchen from scratch with Lockie and a bunch of guys in Ballarat. And yeah, so this whole kitchen is made out of the tree that we cut down in, uh, in, on the 25th of July. So all of these drawers all out of that Cypress Macrocarpa? Yep. And then we've actually used some sugar gum, which is another species that I'd really want to highlight because um, sugar gum can be coppiced. So we use so much, um, so, many, so many poisons to kill competition. So when they replant trees, you know, they poison the soil to get rid of any competition. They plant the trees and then they often lay baits to get rid of the animals that then try and eat <laughs> the young saplings. When you copper something, the root system's there and it just regrows so fast. So when you mean coppicing, you mean that you, you cut down the tree, the, yep. the sugar gum, yep. you send that to the sawmill, you yep. leave the trunk and the root system in the ground, yep. and then it takes off again. Yeah, and you can do that. Like the Japanese and masters, they've been doing that for thousands of years. And the incredible thing about sugar gum, like I've seen some up in um, Ballarat, there's, there's lots around there, but it's incredibly dense. It's a class one durable timber, which means you can put it outside, never oil it, and yep. it'll just go grey, but it'll never rot. Plus also all the limbs and the, the smaller stuff can go for firewood. Yeah. So the main trunk is great for, you know, stuff mm. like this. So imagine, you know, if we plant, if every farm planted 10 of those a year for the next 20 years, you've got, you know, a couple of billion trees that we can access in the future for, and, uh, and I'll never have to plant them again. Okay, I'm talking to all my farmer friends about planting some sugar gum. So then um, we've got a garden out here, which is like the first terrace. And this is like the usable terrace. This window comes all the way out. So we've... We've, it'll be like rain protection as well. So all the cooking is here. Got um, Miller, big Miller induction cooktop, which the exhaust is actually not, like it's connected, so you don't have to turn it on. Okay. Yeah. It actually measures how much steam. Yeah. <laughs> uh, 
And the beauty, I'm a bit, the I'm be- a bit obsessed with Miller because well, I'm, I'm obsessed with induction. So you're obsessed with Miller. I'm obsessed with duck induction because it's forty percent more efficient than gas. You know, so this is. I kind didn't of, know that. Yeah, so because it works with magnetic fields rather than burning and heating something, it actually excites the electrons in the pot itself in the in the the steel of the pot. So, yeah, right. You know, it's it's a direct transfer of energy into heat. You know, so. Um, I've got my dad, my mum's oldest brother, Case. He has bought and sold and repaired Miller his whole life. Yeah. So growing up, like, everything was Miller. Don't buy anything unless it's Miller, you know. <laughs> so we came to Australia with secondhand Miller washing machine, and and uh, and then when Jenny and I moved in to our place when we moved out of home, we found one in the trading post, <laughs> and it was 17 years old from a lady in Caulfield. She was going into a nursing home. Then when we moved into our house, we bought new ones and I gave that washing machine to my brother. So 32 years and then he had it for uh, however long, you know. So I love that they design stuff to last, you know. So um, tell us about this uh, garden out here, yes. Yeah, so this is um, going to be filled mostly with apples and um, rhubarb and there's some horseradish growing there. This is doing really well, actually. And so we what, only really what, planted what are, this yesterday. What are these? So this is the ubiquitous 44-gallon drum. Just um, a 44-gallon drum. But where do, you, where do you get this from and you know that it's safe to grow food in? So there's heaps and heaps of people that recycle these. And all you need to do is ask for food grade. If you tell this, I mean, I love, there's about half a dozen really good companies in, in Melbourne that actually recycle for, and wash 44-gallon drums. And all so you, you literally just Google drum recycler? Yeah. Okay. And they've got washing plant. And they, they can even tell you what it was used for. Mustard, olive oil, jam. You know, they're... It, it, once you build a relationship with them. Yeah. So on this roof, I've got them as normal pots. We've yeah. got them draining at the bottom. So this is actually the ballast for the building. This is the foundation, but I've done it in reverse. So it's sitting at the so top. So ballast, you're putting like the foundation at the top of the building using the weight of this to hold the building down and stop it being blown away in high winds. Yep. Incredible. And then I've used them as a which means up there. Which means historically people would put concrete in the ground, right? Yeah. And then you, you can't recycle the house. Well. The, um, the Federation Square greenhouse in 2008 had 100 tonnes of soil on its roof. <laughs> but that was a 300 square metre building. Yeah. And so the engineer said, well, you can sit that building there, but you've got to use 100 tonnes of soil. I went, beautiful. <laughs> That's what I need. I know something I can do with that. Yeah. So what are you growing here? Um, we've got, this is actually really incredible. Um, this is tea. Oh. So this is a, a, a variety from Japan and it grows the best green tea in the world. And this is asparagus. It's actually starting to flower. Some apples here. These are from JFT. And look, there's one, two, three, four, five. They've only just flowered. Six, seven, eight, nine, <laughs> ten. They're still flowering. So there's, you can see how many apples are on that one. Yeah. That's a lime. And then we've just planted some snow peas and stuff yesterday. This is buckwheat. Joe specifically asked for it. And they're chickpeas. I wonder what Joe's going to do with that. Mate, that's the most exciting bit. I can't wait to see what these guys do. With it. There's a banana there. So yeah, that's the most exciting thing over the next couple of weeks we start planting this garden out. And you've got one more level? Yes. Yeah, let's go up. Can I see that? Yeah. So the toilet will be down there. And then we've got another aquaponic system going in here. So you're about to see the yabbies. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, what a, what a view. <laughs> nice, nice place. Here, um. So you just pulled, you just pulled that yabby out of that half tank there? Yeah. So why have you got yabbies here, Yost? Well, because yabbies are like the perfect urban crop um, um, for aquaculture. They're, they're really resilient. They love eating like lots of leftover food. So yeah. carrots and, and, and leftover bread. And <laughs> so that's the stuff that we should be growing. And then what they're doing is, of course, providing nutrients for, you know, the... the so so the, their, the waste, their waste then puts nutrients into the water? Yeah. And then what do you do with that water? You use it to grow uh, vegetables and, <laughs> and greens. And this, this tank here will actually be filled with um, barramundi. Oh, wow. And so do Matt and Joe get to eat the, some yabbies and the barramundi? Yeah, and uh, freshwater as, as mussels and, okay. and we've got like quite a few. And that will be really, that's probably the most productive two square metres in the whole house. 
So that, that so that's growing media in there. Yep. And so the the liquid from the barramundi and from the yabbies gets pumped through that. Yep. And then the plants go up from that growing media. Yep. And wow. They're, and they're loaded with nutrients because, of course, they're reliant on the nutrients. So watercress, which is the most nutrient dense plant in the world, will be coming off that. You know, okay. because it needs lots of water, water chestnuts, that, things like that. Yep. And so here you can see I've set them up as a wicking bed. Um, use the same barrels and. I've got them on here for water storage, but we, we don't need that here. So can you explain just what a wicking bed is? Yeah, so there's water, I can feel water in there. Yeah, so this is the ultimate zero waste design. A guy called um, Colin, uh, Colin Austin, an Australian guy, who's still alive, he lives in Queensland, invented this for World Vision. When the famine in, in uh, Ethiopia, yep, yep. they invited him to come and ask for his expertise. And he said, well, the problem is that they're losing nutrients. The food that they're eating doesn't contain nutrients because they get these massive downpours. So he invented the wicking bed. So nothing's lost. So when you water this, the water goes in there. And what I've done is the top I've reversed. So that sits like this. So what you can do is put a connection on here, which we'll do in summer. And you can have the water up to there. And the plants access the water from underneath. So the water comes up from the bottom rather than putting the water on the top yep. and then evaporating off. And so you don't have in insect problems on the top. You okay. don't have, and the plants have always got access. But best of all, the food is much more um, loaded with much more micro life. Because you're not just flushing the, 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 the nutrients down into the drainage system. Yeah, because okay. soil, soil microflora want the same as what we do. They want food, air, and water. Yep. The problem with most the way we grow most food is that the water runs out and then the, the bacteria die so all that microflora in the soil whether it's mycelium and the billions and billions of microflora that actually make us like there's there's microflora like uh, mycobacterium vasia which is found in healthy soil which um, alleviates depression and boosts serotonin levels that's only in soil that has a combination of worms and mycelium and lots of rich microflora so it tends to be found on forest floors that you know I think the other interesting thing is that this already seems to be flourishing, whereas you've been to one of our earlier buildings, the Commons, where the rooftop garden there wasn't a wicking bed. It just drained right through, and after a couple of seasons, you know, the plants are really struggling up there. Yeah, so, oh, it's, and I think the problem was that it kind of ran out of air. Yeah. So the soil became too compacted because yeah. the microflora, and that's why worms are so vital as well. Yeah, okay. Because they aerate the soil. But, and, and so worms can survive up here? Yeah. yeah. I mean, as long as there's lots of organic material in there, then that's all they need. And what have you and got up here, Yost? So we've got, we planted a blue lake bean. This is actually from um, my nephew, Miles. He grows veggies. <laughs> Some oats. Um, here we've got buckwheat, more buckwheat for Joe. Chickpeas. Um, we've got some corn. I've actually planted corn here amongst the oats. Got heaps of stuff. <laughs> Incredible. We've got about 250 different types of uh, plants. And so, on the do you think? Do got. you think that there? Like, I mean, the whole goal, right, is that you you built a house that is, is essentially food positive, that it's enough uh, Matt and Joe to live here, to get enough water, to have enough energy, um, to have enough food here. Yeah. Um, and also, they want to have some. They like en entertaining, right? So they're going to have friends over. Yeah. So it's actually going to be yeah more than enough food for them to be able to. That's my goal. Yeah. Yeah. And, and so, and, do you think you know, that do you think that that's going to work? Like you know. Yeah. Yeah, I think. I, think I it wouldn't is. be doing it if. It <laughs> Look, I don't know how, how well it's. You know, like I, I think that this house will be at its best in about five years' time. I'm looking forward you know, to the seeing the lemons and oranges and all that stuff. You I'm know, looking those. forward to seeing Matt and Joe come out of here heaps heavier than what they were when they came in. <laughs> <Yay>. <laughs> I can't wait to... Uh, <laughs> you're vegetarian, aren't you, Jeremy? Yeah. Yeah. So you wouldn't eat fish from here? No. I, 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 would, I would bend the rules for that. Yeah. Yeah. Because it's part of the cycle here, you know? A hundred percent. Yeah. I know where it's come from. I know that it's sustainable. Yeah. Yeah. And really, I'll trust, you know, it. I trust that Joe won't make it suffer. And the <laughs> thing is about, you know, what I said to Joe is that this is like, it's like, you know, a natural ecosystem. So if they're not here, the whole building doesn't work. So the building is reliant on Matt and Joe living here and being part of the cycle. Okay. So as soon as they're gone, it dies. So it's like any good ecosystem. Pretty okay. much, yeah. Incredible. So Thanks for coming, I, I, mate. I, no, my pleasure. It, it, I mean, I, as an architect um, who tries to, you know, like at Breathe, we try to work on sustainable projects. It's mind blowing to see what you do and how you push it to the next level 
and the way in which you think about everything. And um, I know that Bonnie Herring, you know, the director at Braid, you know, just can't be, can't believe what it is that you do when you think through these things. And she loves working with you on these projects. So, well, I mean, you guys helped me so much with this, you know, the initial oh, stuff as I well. No, so. you did, you did. We're just trying to keep you out of trouble, you know. <laughs> <laughs> but no, well, I'm not quite there yet. Well, you know, <laughs> <laughs> I look, I look forward to working with you again and learning more from you. And it's incredible. Well, so much of this was actually part of the Queen Vic market. Yeah. You know, like so many of these ideas, like that mushroom, we were going to do 20,000 of those buckets, you know, yeah. when we did the audit on the waste that no, was being generated at the Queen yeah. Market. Yeah, so this is something that you've been working on for many years and often it gets stopped by bureaucracy or, uh, you know, difficulties with planning or because it doesn't fit under, you know, our planning scheme or our building code, you know, that talks about bricks and mortar and concrete and steel but it doesn't really talk about a food positive system, you know, or reimagining, you know, a whole new housing typology and how to build smaller and more efficient and how to build for the future. So I feel like, you know, you're just about, you know, 20 years out or maybe 50 years out in front I hope not. of all, <laughs> of all yeah. that. But the great thing about this as a pilot, I think, is that it will lead to positive change. People will come here and be able to see this and say, I think, I think this people is are also really, I mean, look at Silo. You know, yeah, you, yeah. Bu you build an example and then it just goes viral. You know, and yeah. I, I think that, and I'm not saying that this is the way it needs to be done. I'm just saying, you know, this is one possible solution. This is one possible solution. We can grow so much food by using, we, we, we generate the water, we've got the footprint, mm. we've got the nutrients. So why are we, we our system is so broken. You know, we, we, our food is not, not nourish, mm. uh, nourishing us anymore because we haven't put the nutrients back in. So we haven't followed you know, the cycle of nature. Yeah. And I just look at the opportunities that, like I, I've got no doubt that in as little as 10 years, it'll be a very different ball game and most of our food will come from where we live. And that means that we can then rewild and replant and, and you know, fix all the damage that we've done. Yeah, and I, I, and I did see um, Zach Bush come out and spoke here, you know, earlier last year. And he was talking about the, the United States largely fed itself after the Second World War from what he called victory gardens, you yeah. know. And so basically, you know, gardens in people's backyards where people nourish themselves. Yeah. And then over time it's become kind of industrialised agriculture, soil health has declined, the quality of nutrients in the, uh, in, in the vegetables you're actually getting is massively declining. So we're doing all this work, spending, spending all this energy, shipping things all around the world yeah. to get less nutrients out of more food. It's kind of insane, but, right? I mean, the, the creative process for this with Joe and Matt has just been unreal as well because I just think we haven't, like there's 30 plus thousand plants that we can eat. So we've got 250, that's, you know, we're scratching the surface here. So the, if we actually adopt these systems and start to look at what's possible, I'll give you an example. Joe loves using milk, you know, we've got access to this incredible dairy farm, 12 yeah. cows, the best farm you could ever find in the world. The rest of the is world. Joe, Joe going to bring a cow here? Well, she would love to, I'm sure, but I don't know if we've got enough grass down there. But I'm like, about a year ago, it was really bugging me that I knew how much she would said, I just don't know how I'm going to go without milk. So I started researching milk, you know, and obviously, we, what are we going to get? Like, pick 50 almonds from an almond tree that's going to make about, you know, we can't grow soybeans. Yeah. But then I discovered um, tiger nuts. So, so I got some tiger nuts, planted them, and then realized they actually grew on my farm already tiger <laughs> nut grass. And then I said to Joe, this doesn't go back, like the earliest history that we've got of us using mammal milk, you know, there's evidence that it was 30,000 years ago. This goes back 1.5 million years ago. There's nutcracker man survived, 80% of their diet was this nutgrass. So is Joe going to make tiger nut milk? Yes. <laughs> and not only that, she's been experimenting with making cheeses and custards and... But see, I that wouldn't I can't have, wait to try but that. But that's not limitation. Like if you're limited to a certain concept, it yeah. forces you to think, like that's the same with zero waste mm. silo. Mm. No, we can't have that. But the interesting thing about zero waste and silo was it, it became, it, it showed that it was possible. And so, you know, we started to see people, you know, doing simple things like, you know, reusing their cups. And then we see something pop up in London, you know, what's happening in London at yeah, the moment? Well, uh, yeah, I'm so proud of Doug. So Doug yeah. was our head chef in, um, in London. And I was at the time looking at doing a silo in London. Yeah. Uh, in Brighton, the Brighton University invited us over, and I was exhausted at that time. And Doug, Doug's dad wasn't well, so he went back, hooked up with the chancellor there, and found an incredible spot and open silo in London without me. But you so know, now there's now now this zero waste idea 
in hospitality continues on. Yeah. And we're seeing, you know, particularly, I mean, incredibly proud Melbourneian to see more and more um, hospitality venues looking at how do they reduce their waste in every, every way that well, they do just, things. You know, yeah. like our, um, in 2008, for here, you know, talking to Phil Sexton and, and, um, and um, Carla, you know, these couple of winemakers, Gary Crittenden, can you put your wine in a keg? They go, are you crazy? Like the only, only we put it in a bottle, but I, they did it, and look at it now. Every yeah, single yeah. venue in Melbourne has that has wine on tap. Yeah. You're talking about millions, hundreds of millions of bottles that don't need to be made, and don't need to be thrown out, don't need to be recycled, and then the whole like even McDonald's has milk on tap now. Yeah, you know it's. Well, just, you can go to the Vic Market and get your wine on tap at the Vic Market with your own reusable bottle. Like it's yeah, incredible. Yeah. Olive yeah. oil, and yeah. I mean it's just we, yeah. yeah. It's, I mean it's. Yeah, I really hope that this is a catalyst. And like I said, I don't, I'm not saying that this, everything we do here is the way that it, you know, it needs to be done. I just want people to get inspired and go, that's, he's doing it like that. Well, what about if we do it like that? I just mm. want it to be a catalyst. Yeah. I think that you'll achieve that, my friend. Well, with guys like you. Oh, oh no, we're not allowed to do that. We're not allowed to do that. Oh, no. Yeah. Thanks so much, Jeremy. Thanks, mate. So close. We made it almost to the end. Let's go and catch a yabby. I'll put my I'll put my hand in there. I'm I'm, lo- I'm hanging out for that. It's amazing uh, how much they eat, you know. Oh, it I'm really hanging out for amazing. the uh, tiger nut milk. <laughs> <laughs>